God that he does take the messes that we make in our lives and turn them into something beautiful and wonderful. <clears throat> because not everything in this world is good. Not everything in this world makes us happy. There is real evil in our world. It does exist. If you don't believe that, pick up your newspaper this morning. Take a look at the news on television. We have terror acts going on all over the world. We have war. We have politicians that are tearing our country apart, both sides and maybe more than two. <clears throat> we have payoffs to officials going on. We have lies. We have scams. Check your email. There will be a scam on there pretty quick. They're coming all the time. We have rape. We have murder. We have fraud. We have graft. Drugs raging throughout our country. No rational person could ever argue that evil does not exist. All you have to do is look around. We're in the midst of this series on how to have purpose in life, and we've been asking some questions. The question, why does it matter what I believe? How do I know what is truth? Are we here by accident or by design? And today, as John mentioned, we are here to talk about how did the world get so messed up because it certainly is. Now there are four things that we're going to look at. We're going to look at the reason for that. <clears throat> we're going to look at the results of the world being so messed up. We're going to look at <clears throat> why does God allow it to continue. And then we're going to look at our response to all of that. So first off, the reason. And the reason really is very simple. The reason the world is so messed up is because we've all sinned. We sin, and that sin brings evil into the world. So let's talk a little bit about sin. I know you came here today to hear about sin. So <clears throat> let's talk about it a little. What is sin? Sin is any attitude or any action that is taken against God. Any attitude or action. It doesn't just have to be an action. It's an attitude. You can have an attitude of sin. And when you do that, it creates evil. Now where did all that begin? I think we probably know the answer to that question. It began in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve saw or were told by the serpent that they could be like God if they would only eat that fruit that God told them not to. I mean, when you think about that, I know it's an old story and it's one that most of us probably have heard over and over and over. But you look in that and it's really very simple. The same thing going on today. Just an attitude of selfishness. I want to be like God. I want to run my own life. I want to make my own decisions. I don't want God telling me what to do. And so it says in Romans 5.12, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. It is through the sin of Adam, that one man, that brought death into the world. We wouldn't even have to face death if it hadn't been for sin. And it didn't stop in the garden, of course. In Ecclesiastes 7, verse 20, it says, There is not a righteous man on earth who does what is right and never sins. Now, <clears throat> uh, I used to say all the time, I've never known anybody that claimed to not sin. And I think I've mentioned this in messages before, until a, a, a lady took that away from me by telling me that she had never sinned. And I, and I struggled with that, and I struggled with her for over an hour, trying to convince her that you have sinned. As a matter of fact, at one point I said, you're sinning right now because you're lying to me. Sin. Everybody sins. That's what the Bible says. And it's true. You can know that from experience. We've never known anybody that lived a perfect life. The only one that ever lived perfectly, of course, was Jesus Christ himself. You sin. I sin. We all do. And there's, there's just absolutely no way around it. Once that sin has been committed, 
something has got to take care of it because sin separates you from God. Just, um, just think about for a moment what we've been singing and who we're singing to. I just love it when, the, when we sing the songs that are directly to God. And, and we're praising Him and giving Him honor for who He is and what He is. And just imagine for a moment the God who sat on the throne was there ruling the entire universe. God with His Son, Jesus, uh, at His right hand. And there He is enthroned in heaven in all of His splendor and all of everything that He had says, I'm going down there. I'm going to go among all that sin because that's the only way I can take care of it. And He did. And He came and He took care of our sin because again, we all have sinned. Now there are three kinds of wrongdoing that are labeled in the Bible. There is sin, there are transgressions, and there is iniquity. And I think it's worth a little time to understand the difference between those three. What are those three? Well the first one, sin, uh, really means to fall short. It's a word that they used to use, for example, if somebody was on an archery range and they were shooting an arrow at a target out there on the range, and the arrow didn't get there. It fell short. That's sin. And that's how the Bible refers to our sin. We fall short. If you are falling short of God's, uh, of God's standard, then you are not fulfilling your purpose in this life. And we're talking about fulfilling our purpose. How do we have purpose in life? Well, when you sin, you fall short. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I hope there's nobody here who will try to claim that you have the same glory that God has. You have fallen short of it, and so have I. We all have. We cannot attain that on our own merit. And then we have the word transgressions. Now transgression means a little more than that. Transgression means to go past what God has set as a standard. To intentionally, in our minds, say, I know God said not to do this, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to go anyway. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have that relationship anyway, even though I know that God has said not to. Very often, when I, when I talk to couples who are, I'm trying to share Jesus with them and bring them to the Lord, and so often these couples are not married in our society today, but they're living together. They're having children together. And, and I get to that point where I said, if you're going to give your life to Jesus Christ totally and completely, it means for one thing, you're either going to have to get married or separate. One of the two. Because, it, I mean, the old phrase, living in sin, we don't want to hear it, but it's still true. It's intentional. You know that God's Word says don't do that. You know that God's Word says that sex is reserved only for those that are married. Man and woman married. And so <clears throat> we actually go past that. That is a transgression. And then iniquities are the intentions of your heart. It doesn't necessarily have to be something that you overtly do. But what's in your heart? How do you feel about God? How do you feel about being his child and being obedient to him? That if, if, if you have set yourself apart from God in that manner in your heart, that is called an iniquity. Now, there's a, a verse in Psalm verse 32, verse, chapter 32, verse 5, that lists all three of these things in one verse. He says, Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said... I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave me the guilt of my sin. Isn't that great? You forgave me of the guilt of my sin. So then the question is, why do we sin? And I think there are three main causes for our sin. The first one is by nature. This is, this is something we just naturally do. It's like when a child disobeys a parent. When a child just does something wrong. 
I mean, they, they do that, we do that by nature. We have this sinful part of us that by nature causes us to do that. But we also sin uh, by nurture. That is, things we learn from other people. They nurture us. They, we learn sin from parents. We learn sin from siblings. We learn sin from friends. And so we sin in that way by nurture. And then a big one today probably always has been, is by culture. You see, our culture, think about this for a minute, the culture we live in, we're so blessed to live in America. I'm so thankful that we do. But at the same time, the culture of America does not lift us up. It drags us down. It makes us worse than we were. The culture of America today says anything goes. Uh, and once again, I know I've said this many times, but all you got to do is watch some ads on TV and you'll see that. I mean, you see, I've seen things come up on TV uh, when my grandkids were in the house. And they come up, even on a kids program, an ad will come up. And I'm, I'm reaching for the remote to turn that thing off. My goodness, how can you have that on there? And it's, and it's, it's prevalent in our society today. Our culture is not lifting us up. We saw, saw that video at the beginning. I hope all of you saw that. I hope all of you read every one of those. Because it used to be that our leaders in this country would be uplifting and giving God glory and, and realizing that the foundation of our country has to be that of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Amen. That's what our country must be founded on. And yet today you know, if you mention, if a politician mentions Jesus, somebody's up there really quick to get the a ACLU and say that separation of church and state and get all excited about that. That uh, is our culture today. So how did the world get so messed up? Well, it began with Adam and we follow his example and sin always damages. The result of that sin is that we live in a fallen world. We live on a broken planet. We, we, our planet is damaged. It is damaged in many ways. We are injured. We are spoiled. We have been corrupted on this planet by evil. People ask the question every once in a while, well, why did this happen? Why did that happen? And the reason is really simple. It's because we live in a fallen world. Uh, people get killed, innocent people die, things happen, and you say, why? Well, because we live in a fallen, broken world. Once sin took place, this planet was broken. Why do we have uh, hurricanes? Why do we have volcanoes? Why do we have tidal waves? Why do we have uh, any of those things in nature? Because nature is irra in, irrational, and because... Uh, I'm going to have to pause for a minute because I know that's getting very distracting out there. I see a lot of you turning your face. I, I'm not sure what's going on, but I think there's a malfunction. Yeah, John, thank you. Just ask him to do it somewhere else. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, it distracted me too. So, and I saw several of you turning to look that way. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, this planet is not heaven. Now, when it was first created, we need to understand that when it was first created, it was. It was perfect. Adam and Eve lived in a perfect garden, and it would have stayed that way. And I can't, I can't even begin to try to say what things would be like now had they not sinned, had sin not come into the world. But I do know this, that what they had, can you imagine living in a garden where God would come into the garden with you every now and then and go for a walk with you and explain some things to you and, and ask you a question, just have a conversation because He loves you? I mean, how marvelous is that? Well, it's heaven, okay? That's exactly what it is. It, but this planet is not heaven. It is not a perfect place. Romans 8, verses 20 and 21 say, For the creation was subjected to frustration not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself 
will be liberated from its bondage to decay. Even the creation, even this planet will be, will be fixed, okay? It will, it will be liberated from its bondage to decay. Again, this is one of those subjects that is really difficult to comprehend, really difficult to explain. But even our planet groans, it says in the Bible, as if in the throes of giving birth. Our planet, everything that God created, He created good, and sin took it down. Sin is what has broken our planet. Because of sin, uh, we have innocence uh, with disease. We have people with AIDS. We have people with uh, environmental problems and all over the world. And all of that comes because of sin. Another reason is that uh, there is physical decay. Another thing is that there is physical decay. And there is death because we live on this uh, fallen planet. 2 Corinthians 4.16 says, Outwardly, we are wasting away. Outwardly. In other words, boy, the older you get, the more you realize that. You know, I'm just wasting away. Uh, I heard about uh, a young lady was in a restaurant, single lady, and uh, sitting at a table when a young man, single also, sat down at the table next to her. And just as he sat down, she had a sneezing fit. You ever have one of those? I sneezed 25 times in a row the other day. That just happens to me. And that happened to this young lady. But she had another problem because as she was sneezing so much, she had a glass eye that popped out. <laughs> and the young man grabbed it before it hit the floor so it didn't shatter. Well, that caused him to talk and even laugh about what was going on. And they went out on a date. A year later, they were getting married. And when they went to see their pastor for some counseling before they got married, the pastor said to the young lady, well, what drew you to him in the first place? And she said, he just kind of caught my eye. <laughs> I was telling that to Barbara the other day, and she said it before I could say it. So I thought some of you might. <laughs> he just... <laughs> uh, so we have this physical decay, and it, we have a law, and I mean it's a law, it's not a theory, a law that is called the law of entropy. It's also called the second law of thermodynamics. I'm not a scientist, and I can't explain it completely, and I usually have somebody that has more knowledge than me say something to me about it when I do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. What that amounts to is that everything is running down. Everything is cooling off. It's a proof of the existence of God. Because if everything is running down, that means it has to have a beginning. Anything that has an end has to have had a beginning. And so God created. And they come up with all this stuff, you know, the Big Bang Theory, right? I think maybe God did start it off with a Big Bang. But the question for those who say, well, it all just started with a big bang and it's, you know, it's just an accident. I got one simple question. What blew up? What was there that blew up? And where did it come from? The only answer to that question is God. And somebody else said to me once, said, well, God uh, has the same problem. He's living within that, that scientific realm as well. No, God never had a beginning. God told us that when he talked to Moses from the burning bush. I am that I am. In other words, I have always been. I will never end. I did not have a beginning. I will not have an end. Comprehend that. I can't. But I do know it's true. That God has always existed. Uh, and therefore, he always will exist. So, all creation is looking to renewal because of the way this world has gotten so messed up. The third thing there is relational problems. Adam and Eve, when they sinned, were disconnected from God. And when you and I sin today, we get disconnected from God. So now, Adam and Eve had family problems. Family difficulties came into the world. They had had this wonderful intimacy with God. They had had this this face-to-face kind of relationship with God where they could walk with Him and talk with Him 
and now it was gone. Uh, <clears throat> they, they at that point had had no bad history. They had no bad memories. Uh, they didn't have any of that. And sin came in and ruined it all. Genesis 3, 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And we've been covering up ever since. That's what humanity does. We hide our real self, just like Adam ran and tried to hide from God. And then on top of that, he blamed God. He told God, he said, the woman that you made for me made me do it. It's her fault, but it's ultimately your fault because you created her. And we've been blaming God for things ever since, too. I just hate it that insurance companies say this was an act of God. You know, when a tornado hits somebody's home, it's what they call it, an act of God. And it's not. It's an act of a broken planet, a ruined environment. Uh, so now the fourth result is that of spiritual discontent and darkness. Spiritual discontentment and darkness. You see, we have a hole in our heart that can only be filled by God. It can't be filled by anything else. Uh, we, when we uh, get disconnected from God, that hole is there. And you know what we do? We try to fill it with anything but God. We try to fill it with uh, popularity. We try to fill it with money. We try to fill it with sex. We try to fill it with power. And we're disconnected from the source of life itself. And it's not a pretty picture. But I have good news. It's not all bad news. Lamentations 3, 19 to 23. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them. And my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. What a passage of Scripture. What good news. The reason the world is in such a mess is because of sin. And so the question now would come up, why does God allow it? Why does God not just shut it down? And the answer is because history is moving toward a climax. There is a coming day where it will all come together. So I want to give you three reasons that God uh, is not shutting it down, that God is allowing it to continue. The first one is because uh, he, he wants to give us a choice. Deuteronomy chapter 30 Verses 15 and verses 19. 15 first. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. Then verse 19. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you, and I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. That only makes sense, doesn't it? God says, I give you life or death. Which one do you want? Choose life. Because then you and your children will live. <clears throat> God, uh, we were created in the image of God Himself. And then He gives us a free choice. God wants us to choose to live for Him. God wants us to choose Jesus. God wants us to be in His kingdom and in His family. But He will not force us to do that. We often pray for other people to come to Christ. I do. We all should. If we know somebody that's outside Christ, pray for them to come to Christ. But we also need to realize that God will not force anyone to come to Him. Because that's not true love. Being forced to come to God does not give God glory. God gets glory when we make a free will choice within our hearts to come to Him. Uh, and so He does not want to force us. He wants us to choose. Are you going to live with your purpose? Or are you going to live with God's purpose? That's what He wants us to choose. Uh, are you going to try to live on your own? I've got bad news for you. 
you're going to have to live with the consequences. And there will be consequences. Drugs, infidelity, murder, any of that. Lying has never been free of consequences. There are always consequences. So, you have a choice. Ecclesiastes 3.17 says, God will bring to judgment both the righteous and the wicked. I'm telling you, this world is headed toward a climax. And there will be a judgment day of both the righteous and the wicked. Now, the second reason God allows it to continue is to show us the need for a Savior. The worse things get, the more we can see the need. Without God, we tend to live like animals. Without God, we tend to do whatever we feel like doing. And God addressed this in the, in the first chapter of the book of Romans, where he said repeatedly, God gave them over. God gave them over. God gave them over. In other words, God says, if that's what you want to do, if that's your choice, then have at it. Go ahead and live that way. That's what you want, but there will be consequences. Uh, we human beings think, well, I, I know better, and I like it this way, and I ought to be, be able to do whatever I want on my own. I shouldn't have to have a conscience. I can just, I ought to be able to just live the way I want to live. And I can say anything, I can do anything. A human being thinks this is a better way to go. But that's why you need a Savior. That's why I need a Savior. Uh, there are things in our lives that we want to change, and we just can't. If you don't believe that, read Romans 7. And read how the Apostle Paul himself said, I want to do these good things, but I don't. And I don't want to do these bad things, but I do. And he goes agonizingly through this, saying it over and over and over again. And you do, and I do. But at the end of that, thanks be to God for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I can change through Him. He can give me the power to do that. And will, if we will just allow Him. The third reason God allows it to continue is to demonstrate His grace. 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promises. Some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance. From that verse, my personal understanding is that God's going to allow it to continue until the day when there's nobody left that will turn to Him. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to predict anything. I don't know when that day will be. It could be today. Tomorrow. I don't know. But He is saying, God loves every human being. And God wants every human being to turn to Him. And he is holding off, allowing, being patient to allow people to change their hearts and to come to him. You know, during the days of the ark, Noah was building the ark and preaching for a hundred years. Building the ark and preaching. And he got no converts. Not one person. Nobody changed. Boy, you talk about a disheartened preacher. Sometimes I think, you know, I get a little disheartened and I think... But not like Noah, <laughs> you know. That he had no converts. But the day that the flood came, Noah and his family and the animals got on the ark and Noah did not close the door. God did. That's what Scripture tells us. God closed the door of the ark. I would imagine there were a lot of people trying to pull it back open. Don't you? Water start coming up. They realize what Moses has been saying for a hundred years. And let me on that ark. But it's too late. And there will come a day for us at the end of time when God will close the door. And it's too late. He doesn't want that to happen. Now that's the, that's the big point. We need to understand that. Because a whole lot of people try to teach that everybody gets to go to heaven regardless of who you are, what you've done, regardless of whether or not you've acknowledged Jesus and you've repented, been baptized. It doesn't make a difference. You don't even have to believe. Everybody gets to go to heaven. God wants that to happen. But God says you've got to make that decision. 
you must. And that's the only way that you will get to go. Uh, <clears throat> the unbeliever says, I can't believe in a God who allows pain, allows suffering, rape, murder. You know what? I don't either. Because it's not a matter of God allowing that. It's a matter of God waiting, being patient for people to turn. And every time one of us does something like that to another one of us, God hurts. God cries. God hurts, is in pain with every one of us as well. He will bring judgment one day. One day all of those things will be set straight. But until that day, He's being patient. And He's allowing time for all of us to come to Christ. So how do I respond to that? Well, I remember that Jesus is the Lamb. Jesus was sacrificed for a broken world. It's an amazing thing when you study Scripture and you see that there, in, the, in the old Jewish days they had a high priest and the high priest had certain duties that he was to perform and one of those was to slay the lamb. To kill a lamb so that the sins of the people would be rolled forward. Now, Jesus Christ is described in the New Testament to us as both the lamb and the high priest. So Jesus had it in his control to not go to the cross should he decide not to. He could have stayed away. From, he could have said, Father, they're beyond repair. Let's just end it. He could have done that. But he didn't. I want you to really get how much Jesus loves you. Because he did that for you personally. The Bible indicates that if only one of us in the entire world, only one of us had sinned and everybody else lived perfectly, Jesus still would have gone to the cross for that one person. Jesus loves you that much. That's how much he cares for you. And so uh, we need to remember that he is the lamb. Then we need to receive God's grace daily, every day. Oh, Father, forgive me. And, and let me receive that grace. Allow that grace to come into your life. And then remember that this place is temporary. This world is going to be gone. This world is only temporary. Uh, heaven is permanent. The spiritual world is real. This world is only here for a little while. And the third thing or whatever number I'm on, I'm lost. Uh, <laughs> reject man-made solutions. Reject them because unmet needs will not be fulfilled by a fallen world. You've got to look to God for that. So don't try to fill those needs with wrong things. Jeremiah 2.13, I gave you this not too long ago. I'd like to go through it again. It's a powerful scripture. My, God is speaking and he says, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water. And they have dug their own cisterns, that is a well, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. So not only do we human beings reject the living water, we go off and dig a well, and try to get up our own water. In other words, we try to fill that hole in our heart with drugs, with alcohol, with money, with, with anything else. We try to fill that hole and it won't work. It just won't work. And so we sin by rejecting God in the first place. We sin again by trying to replace Him with anything else. My people, God said, have committed two sins. And that's, that's so true. The... Uh, the last thing we need to do is to reach out to others with God's love. I, uh, just a rhetorical question for you. Do you really believe that Jesus Christ has saved your soul? Amen. You've been to Him. You've been to Him. You've accepted Him as the Son of God. You have confessed your sins. You have repented of an old way of life. 
You've been buried with Him in water. And you know that your sins are washed away. And you're going to heaven. My question is, why aren't we telling the world? Why, why are we not telling those that are the closest to us? I, I just, it just boggles my mind. And I'm, and I'm not blaming you. I'm, I'm asking the same question of me. You know, it's the most important thing on the face of the earth. So when I say we, I mean all Christians. Why are we not? Why is Christianity on the decline? I don't get it. I don't understand it. The only thing I can see is, is a whole lot don't really believe it. Ah, right, everybody will be all right. No, they won't. You don't come to Jesus, you don't get heaven. You don't live with God forever. So testify. You know, I know it frightens many of us. I know that. And you think, I got to know more about the Bible. No, you don't. Oh, do you know how you got saved? Yep. And if you don't know how you got saved, see me after church because I'm going to explain it to you and we'll do it again. Because you need to know how you got saved. And if you know how you got saved, that's all the story you need. You know, uh, you just tell people, what did God do for me? How did that happen? I know for me it's a, it's a testimony of having a guy come over to our house and sit in our kitchen with us. Barbara and I, I don't even, uh, many of you may not know this, and I know some people get a bad picture in your mind, but the, remember, we were lost, okay? Uh, sat in our kitchen telling us about Jesus, and Barbara and I blowing smoke in his face for about three or four hours that night because we were both smokers, heavy. And... Uh, him asking for a glass of water about every 15 minutes. I mean, it was, it was rough on him. I know that now, Larry Wishard. But when Larry got through explaining about Jesus to us and asked us if we wanted to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we both were, yes. Are you ready to be baptized? And I said, what? Now? He just been through all that. That when you're ready, you do it now. You don't wait it was about midnight by that time. And, and then I thought about it for a minute and I said, well, yeah, why wait? And Barbara and I were both baptized just before midnight on April the 1st, 1974. Now that's my story. And Jesus Christ saved us. I mean, you don't, I, you don't need to know a lot of Bible to know that. You just need to be willing to tell your story. I urge you to do that because we live in a broken world. We live on a broken planet. And people need the salvation of Jesus Christ. Amen. Pass it on to others around you. I urge you. Would you stand with me, please? And let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for these wonderful brothers and sisters that I have. Thank you for giving us, uh, giving them to me and me to them and that we are all together in your family. I pray, Father, that you would bless our day today. We thank you for the freedom that we have in this country. Help us to live in that freedom uh, as Christians so that people can see uh, Jesus in us. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.